Paul slammed the office door, or at least he tried to. Due to its sagging hinges, it stuck on the worn carpet. He had to lift it up by the handle and then shoulder it into place to get it to close at all. When the lock finally clicked shut, he gave the bottom of the door a kick. This gave him a sore toe and none of the satisfaction that a slam would have provided. He was in a foul mood. It had been a disastrous morning at the end of a bad week that was putting the finishing touches to the worst months of his life. Eight months ago, several people had tried to kill him. He was beginning to think it had been a terrible mistake not to have let them. He'd just come back from a meeting with the private security authority that had been nothing short of humiliating. Mr. Bradshaw, the only human being left on the planet who still unironically wore a dicky bow, had been blessed with the most patronizing manner imaginable. So, let me get this straight. Mr. Mulcrone, you wish to set up a private investigation agency with your two partners, one of whom you've not spoken to in over a month, and the other of whom you cannot currently locate? Paul had gone for the honesty is the best policy approach, thinking that his frankness would be appreciated. He had been dead wrong. He couldn't remember the last time he had been right about anything. He tried ringing Bridget for about the thousandth time last night. Her phone had made a funny noise. He was ninety-five percent sure she had blocked his number. She'd not spoken to him in the forty-two days since the incident, although she had screamed at him a few times, just to make clear her position vis-a-vis -vis him being the lowest scum on God's green earth. The fact that Paul entirely agreed with her assessment was now the only thing they had in common. Well, that and the fact that their names were both on the application forms they had submitted to the PSA back in their pre-incident happier days. Bunny was a different story. Paul had left him about fifteen messages over the last three days, none of which he'd responded to in any way. The last time he'd seen him, Paul had gone to great lengths to impress upon Bunny the importance of the PSA meeting. Of the three of them, retired Detective Sergeant Bunny McGarry was the only one who had the required five years of relevant experience needed to qualify for a private investigator's license. He may not have been everyone's idea of what a Garda officer should be, and his superiors may have thrown a parade when they finally persuaded him to take early retirement. But nobody could deny that Bunny McGarry had been a copper, and in his own hyper-belligerent way, a very effective one. Paul was vaguely aware that Bunny may have been struggling with the loss of the job that so defined him, but he was far too busy self-basting in his own misery to pay attention to someone else's. Besides, it wasn't like they had a particularly touchy-feely relationship. Prior to eight months ago, They'd not spoken for fifteen years, until Bunny had decided to intervene in the whole people-trying-to-kill-him situation. Whatever residual gratitude Paul felt about that had evaporated when Bunny had not shown up that morning and left him sitting there in the PSA's reception in his funeral suit, looking like an idiot. The last time Paul had worn the suit was just over two months ago, when Bridget's granny had died and he'd accompanied her to the funeral over in Leitrim. She had introduced him to people as her boyfriend. He'd liked it. He'd never been a boyfriend before. The week after, when Paul had finally lost the use of his great-aunt Fidelma's house, he'd moved in with Bridget. Life had been good. As he sat in the PSA's foyer that morning, he'd found a sausage roll in the suit's inside pocket. He must have slipped it in there at the funeral buffet for the drive back to Dublin, and then promptly forgotten all about it. In a fit of food safety standards defying sentimentality, he'd eaten it, then sat there alone with a broken heart and stomach cramps.